to go. Welcome all of you this evening. It's a great pleasure uh, on behalf of everyone at the AA to welcome Kevin Binet back to the AA um, to show us aspects of her career that began in this building and some of these spaces a little over 20 years ago. Um, his lecture tonight, of course, is part of the exhibition across the hall and upstairs titled Site Works, which opened last Friday, which includes photographs by Helen of work by Peter Zumtor, John Heda, Zaha Hadid, Le Corbusier, and many others. I hope you all have had a chance to see that exhibition, and if not, uh, please do so afterwards. Um, the exhibition, of course, is a 20-year re retrospective of what all of us would agree is one of the really important careers in architectural photography today. Helen has given access and opportunity to document and photograph work in ways that few other architects few other photographers are allowed by architects around the world. It's a testament to her ability to invent and create uh, and think through the possibilities of projects as they exist through the media of photography, and that's what we'll be seeing this evening. <coughs> as I mentioned the other night in the opening of the exhibition, it really is a near cliche today to simply say that we live in a world full of images and that we're all architects operating in an age and an era dominated by architectural images and their photographs. Uh, it has been 40 years or more since someone like Guy Debord wrote that ours isn't just an era defined by images, but a world shaped through the continuous exchange of imagery. I think in all of the kind of postmodern deconstruction and other kinds of language that are used today to talk about spectacles and imagery, what's often glossed over, especially by architects, I think, is the real craft work, ingenuity, creativity, skill, and techniques that go in the making of photographs and other kinds of images. That's really the talent and the expertise that Helen has had throughout her career, and that's what she'll be sharing with us this evening. <coughs> the, the exhibition, uh, it, it's a great honor for us to be putting on here at the A. Isn't just an opportunity to invite Helen back in the building, but for us, it's also an attempt in these coming years to try and shape a cultural sphere within which architects operate these days, which includes not just photographers, but graphic designers, filmmakers, image makers of all kinds that really create the, the expanded field within which all of us as architects operate today. It's a great honor to be able to start that kind of a, of a project with the works of someone who's such a leading figure in her own chosen discipline, which is photography. <coughs> her photographs, for many of us that have known her over the years, have reshaped the way we actually think about some of these projects that she shows in her images. Her career began in 1986, documenting a piece of a set of furniture which I had spent my fifth year at the AA drawing, and which I thought I knew pretty well after a year of drawing but which of course became something else entirely once someone like Helen was given the opportunity to see it her way. I think that's the continuous experience many of us have had over the years with a number of buildings and projects around the world really that are able to be seen anew every time that she's given an opportunity to explore them on her own terms. <coughs> Helen was born in Switzerland, studied photography in Rome, and resides now in London. Before introducing her tonight, please let me just take the opportunity to thank a number of people who have helped us with creating the exhibition and putting it together. First, Vicki Richardson and Blueprint Magazine, who are our media sponsors for the show across the hall, and whose magazine this month is focusing on the topic of architectural photography, and which includes an interview with Helen and Zaha talking about their 20-year collaboration on work. Um, Dirk Lalau, who designed the exhibition across the way in the gallery. Peter Salter for a beautiful essay that talks about the work as a part of the guide which is included in the exhibition. Of course, Vanessa, Simone, and Lee, and everyone here at the AA who put the exhibition together, arranged it, and helped to design it in the spaces. Uh, Wayne and Zach upstairs for putting the guide together, and of course, mostly Helen for giving us the opportunity to put the work together and share it with all of you tonight. Helen, thank you very much, and please join me in welcoming Helen Bedell. Fred, thank you very much for this opportunity again. I have to do some thanks, but it's extremely important for me to be here tonight and with this show after 20 years. And um, I'm going to go through this experience of photographic architecture, which started exactly here on Bedford Square. 
it started when I was asked to photograph um, the collapse of time uh, built by the student and uh, designed by John Herriot. At the time, I didn't know much about architecture. I didn't know about architecture photography. And here I was confronted with an amazing object, a piece full of thought, which I had no reference. And the camera was, was for me a tool, was a way to understand what was in front of me. And this is a condition that I think is very important. And I would like to have it again and again every time I photograph. The way to photograph, it's not to reproduce. There's no way we can compete with the experience of architecture. It's about taking apart, understanding which one of the most important idea and how they've been brought together. I've been working, so trying to understand this process of um, photographing architecture, but for that also to perceive architecture for the last, well, now tw almost 20 years. And the more I get closer to understand what is perceiving space, what is the experience of being a space, the more I come with a vocabulary, with a description, which goes away from what photography can do. If we think about being a building, I know, our experience. Like John Hedrick say, we are digested by the building. There's no other form of art where we can be digested by it. Our experience are very complete, very fluid. They are weaved together. All the sense are working. There's a continuity. Zaha Hadid said in an article about Lucien Hervé, space is a fluid counterpoint to the dense materiality. It's frozen and yet fluid. There's something endless in space uh, within which the fragment are placed. And this idea of a fragment, I come with my camera, the photograph. Uh, what the camera can do? It's a very simple tool. Uh, we can frame. So we create edges where we define a new reality. We displace it, which is something I'm very proud of. We can bring it to a book. We can bring it to a, a projection. We can bring it to a space like an exhibition. We can play with time, uh, giving it temporality, or getting free from the idea of a temporality. We can rename. If we photograph a line of window, and we photograph one window, this be the be becomes the window photograph on the 16th of March. All these experiences are very simple, like I said, but they don't somehow they don't match very well with the experience of architecture. And that's why the more I work, the more I think, I don't want to compete. I have my own tools. I prefer to reduce. I prefer to work with details. I prefer to work with black and white. And to bring one experience, one strong moment that you had in that building back to you. The way it's built, the way the light works, the way phenomena can be created. Sometimes space is like a box, a very simple box that allows things to happen, and I follow them with my camera. I have an image, which is an image of a blind person that maybe can give you an idea of what photography can do. As a blind, we cannot have a panoramic of the view. We cannot have this continuity. All our experience are like Alan the sea. So they are all very strong experiences that we can touch, and only with our imagination after we can bring together. This process of reducing is also confirmed by, there's a phrase of Aristotle saying, why do we perceive uh, sounds better at night? Our sensibility becomes more acute by reducing what we can see or listen to. Before I start to show you a photograph, because I don't want to um, only talk, but I would like very much to show you some of my work, I want to think about uh, one moment, what is the mind of the you know, architect when he thinks about photography, when he thinks about his building. I don't think he has never one image, but I think he has a series always. And if we have a series, we have time. And I think these are two very important elements of photo architecture, is the possibility of bringing with a series over a very specific rhythm images that somehow bring back some of the aspect. 
the, the field of architectural photography is getting stronger and stronger and um, also developed in a very different way by different photographers and artists. And there is this fantastic article that came on Blueprint recently that's discussing. I think it's very important to also see it as an independent um, art and craft, which is um, not only fulfilling the end of a long creation, which is the process of architecture, but it has its own life and independence. Can we have some of the slides and the light down? In 2001, I was uh, invited by the DAM, the Museum of uh, Architecture in Frankfurt, to do an exhibition about shadow in architecture. I was part of the team of curators, but also one of the artists asked to do some work. Of course, it was a wonderful invitation to think about architecture only as a way of creating shadows. So I chose La Tourette by Le Corbusier. I chose a monastery because it's like a mini world. It's like a small city where many events can happen in one space. It's the Dominican uh, monastery, which is also a very close. Um, the, the, the emphasis of the Dominican are to uh, concentrating on thinking and learning, not so much to the outside world and to the nature. I looked at the shadow and I really tried to understand how Le Corbusier has been orchestrating different shadows to create moments in a space that are related to their functions. And I came across an immense variety of moments of light and shadows. Before to go further and, and try to uh, describe the shadow, I like sometimes to think about what is a shadow. And there is a, a lot of definition if you read the literature on shadows. But the idea that maybe it's a, um, a residue of darkness. So first there was darkness, and then the light came. It's a very beautiful idea because every time you are confronted to the sh with the shadow, you are brought back in time and space with very big dimension. There's another aspect that I like to think about when I look at shadow is that this, it is electromagnetic radiation, so it is energy uh, when I think about light. And the moment we have a shadow, we have an absence. And if I think about an absence of energy, um, maybe thinking about silence or um, maybe cold. It's one of these absence that are telling us the most. Shadow are telling us things, even if it's a sign of something not being there. Of course, if we look at mythology, magic, underworld, there's a lot of reference. But now I wanted to take them also quite independently, one by one. When I looked at this first, um, when we look at this first photograph, I spent uh, about one week with the camera in one position, looking at the main wall that is uh, holding the church. It's the wall where you have the monastery where there's all the function of life and then there's a church. And every part of the area which is more functional is projecting a shadow over the wall of the church over the day. So it's like if the reason of being, it's of course the church but then all the different functions are brought back bidimensionally on the main wall. Next, please. Le Corbusier said, we can't look at nature. It's too complex. We needed to frame. So I started to look at all his um, windows in the very complex way in which he was framing the, um, the world. And again, the black window become shadow. So it's about an absence that allowed us to see more specific part of the building. Next. Next. Naming. The two photographs that you see there are almost the same area of the building. The camera has a slight shift. It was very difficult for me to frame a shadow. Your eyes are all the time dragged to the light. And by a small shift, one image can be an image of light, or one can be an image of a shadow. And again, to decide, do I'm photographing light, or do I'm photographing shadow, was all the time a very, very difficult moment. And I think this photograph really shows how the intention, 
has to be very well calibrated. Next. So I looked at the window, I looked at the wall, and then I looked at the main corridor over the different time of the day that takes you to the church. On the right, you see a big window that was designed actually by Tsenakis before to be a composer. He was also an architect and worked with the Corbusier. In the case of those photographs, I was just looking about how the space and the volume were changing with a different time of the day. Next. <coughs> Next. Over the day, the, the monks go to the different um, liturgy, and it's very beautiful to see how they carry on their own body the shadow into the space. They are the shadows that are created by this window. We are making a very specific pattern. I will go back to it a little bit later, but I'd like you to already look at it. It's a very beautiful, rhythmic, uh, and very musical, of course, uh, orchestration of uh, light and shadow that allows you to find your way to the church. <coughs> Next. Inside the church, you are wrapped by a very soft light. There's no edge to the shadow. Shadow can be very clear where it starts and finish, like we have seen before. They can be cast by an object, but the moment you come into a space which is completely um, obscured, the shadow has it's, a, it's endless, because if you think about maybe looking under the chair, it becomes dark, dark and dark and more obscure, and there's no point where you can see where it stops and starts. Next. Again, this very soft light, it's there to create concentration. So we had, we had a darkness and light to allow you to see. We had one to allow you to go somewhere, and now we have one that allowed you to concentrate for the liturgy. Next. Going back to the corridor, I went back many times and were thinking that uh, Zanaki was a musician, and he must have really think about um, how to create with light and space something he was also maybe doing with his, um, his uh, musical um, capacity. And it was very clear that there was a sense of harmony and counterpoint by super superposition of different melody. Um, you could read it in different way. You could do a vertical and you can read it horizontally. But his work was also quite avant-garde, like Le Corbusier, and I wanted to find something that also disturbs you, some dissonance, not only an easy, regular path of light. And um, I couldn't find a drawing, but this corridor has a second one, which is orthogonal, which creates also the light in the same way. Next slide, please. So it creates refraction and refraction of light which somehow disturbs you and disturbs your path, which take you, so the path to the church is not easy. It has also lines of moment of doubts. Next, please. Then I decided to look at what it does on the floor. So like I say often, the way I photograph, it's a condition, it's created by the wall, and I photograph what it does. The wall, the structure will appear bit by bit, but most what situation it creates. Mm -hmm. These photographs are shown here in an exhibition, and they, they really make you feeling what is creating on the floor. But then I wanted to see how exactly, next, the light becomes less and less when the sun moves, and the angle which the sun hit the window becomes sharp and sharper. Next. So I did the same thing with my camera. I was first very much in the front, and then bit by bit, Next, please. I move until there's no space for the glass. It's only concrete, only a little bit, the same way the sun is doing around the window. In a the cell, there's no decoration. There's not much. It's just a little room and a balcony. But there's a little box. And the box is catching light over the day. 
and somehow giving an idea of time to the monkey that's sitting there and they become very classic almost black square next please next please or almost a study of light it was just just by being there and looking at all the different possibilities that the sound could do it was maybe in a um, quite late spring time so the sun was quite high and it was fantastic next please <coughs> next after this amazing experience to live there to live with a monk that thought I was very um, funny character sitting there sometime all the day with a camera and waiting and sometimes it came a night with wine and they said in French this is to see better. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had difficulty to find another subject for the exhibition um, uh, as complex and um, with so many different shadows and um, maybe I wanted to go to Japan it was too far to um, study Sijima, very soft light, but uh, I had the idea of uh, also wanted to bring to this exhibition a dimension of shadow that they can connect you to very big scale. So I've been told about this observatory in, uh, in, um, in India, in Japur, called Janta Manta. And also I know, I knew that um, Le Corbusier liked it very much and talked about also architecture is object in light. So I thought it was maybe an interesting connection to, uh, to go there. It, it's a big observatory. It was built in 1726, I think, in a time where uh, science was very developed. The word uh, janta, an instrument, manta is a movement in Hinduism at that period. And um, this, this object embody uh, both of them very well. They are built in an extremely precise way to allow you to measure the sound, so the, to, to, to connect you with the sh sound to measure the time, to predict eclipse, tracking star in orbit. So even nowadays, we don't know how they manage to be such a precise and such an accurate instrument. Next, please. There is a dimension to it, which is also um, astrology. Uh, people come there from very far away. I met people that have been traveling 27 hours in a bus uh, to, uh, to be able to read um, with astrology their future, their cycle of life. And this was also, I thought, a very important dimension that the shadows and these faces were allowed to, uh, to bring the human being to a bigger scale, to understand bigger scale that normally are not tangible. Next, please. There's the precision and the beauty of those drawings in the marble and in the masonry, which are um, fantastic. Next, please. The connection between the structure and the, and the light and the, the, the rest of the universe universe, it's given by the shadow, this little, little shadow. And I felt that I was really a mad woman traveling all the way to India. You can imagine what does it mean being in a city like Japur, which is overwhelming by amount of people and life and, and sitting there and looking at the four centimeter little shadow over day and day. Um, I did few image of the total view, but the idea was to bring shadows back to Germany. Next, please. Next, like this, you can really see the precision in which they're made. Next, next. Some of them are very big, and they are the one which are sundial. You can you can um, walk up and really uh, be next to the shadow and follow the time as you walk up with you. That's a very nice dimension that you see that if you, you know, that the shadow is with you, assigning the time. Next. Next. Next.
let's leave India and um, oh, that's a general view that I still feel I have to bring to the context. It's a very quiet place, few people, some animals, with a, mm, surrounded by a, a fantastic city, glory of life, and it is like a garden of peace where many, many Indian people come and sit and think about the light to leave a shadow. We move far away, Nordic country, different time. Uh, I try here to bring few projects that I photographed and I liked very much, but also very dim different dimension. Um, I thought about just showing briefly um, the square in Kalma built by Carlos and St. John's. I work for them a lot and enjoy very much uh, to follow their career since the little uh, warehouse conversion this one yard. And I, I decided to photograph this, to bring here this square because it has this dimension of being like a tapestry, a tapestry of events which are um, indicated by the way it's been built, plus the shadow of the building, which indicate what's happening in a city. They are, it's, a, it's a very traditional city where you have the town hall, the church, the main uh, business office sitting there. So all of that fold into one space in the square. Next, please. It's a collage of stone. You probably know the project uh, with the um, street, which have been redesigned by them, old stone and new stone that allowed the organization of the square to be brought alive again. Next. 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 There's one more, next maybe slides, uh, element I want to bring that I thought it was absolutely fantastic. So the, this uh, the idea of this folding of the shadow of the roll of the square around that square, but then they invited an artist, Eva Lofdal, to build something there and she made this fantastic well where you can hear the water so you have a very dimension very deep dimension and then she built very high pole which are like again a sandal which give this this height so the feeling of something very flat but still with depth was fantastic next please These are the poles that are giving the height. Next. Tito Junto. Next. Let's see. Actually, um, you all know I worked with him. Uh, he created this book about 10 years ago, I call Works, where I photograph all his architecture. It was an um, amazing experience and a very, very beautiful book. And um, yes, I think the ability of photography to unfold over pages is something quite fantastic. And I think photography in a book can create a space again. I wanted to bring only one of the projects I did with him here today um, because I revisit 10 years later. He asked me to do a book again on vowels, which was not easy. I wanted to bring it also because it's a building that has a very strong um, role in nature, is somehow uh, sitting in a quite an amazing setting in Alp. And uh, again, if I think about Le Corbusier that said nature needs to be framed, I think this building allowed you to uh, to relate it to the nature, which is much, much bigger, to somehow measure and have yourself have a position in relation to the surrounding. It's a building which is mostly under the ground, and it allows also maybe somehow to measure. Next. <coughs> Light and water and stone are what make this building. Light comes in by very 
simple slot that allows the building to have daylight in a different places. And this is the roof where the light comes next. This is the roof 10 days before. Next. This is how it comes down. So again, sometimes my device are very simple. Let's see how it works. And the rest will come. Next. Next, let's see how it, the wall uh, are touched by the light. Next. When I photograph, I really um, try to look at phenomena. And one of them is light, an event like traces erosions, uh, presence of the water. And in that case, I thought the light was really allowed in me to, to feel and understand and measure also the volume of the place. Next. And here I want to just talk a little bit about color. You've seen that my, my closest work is in black and white. And uh, I mentioned early on that I am really concerned about this process of reducing and details and um, when I was there at night, uh, sitting and um, thinking about how to photograph again, I was um, I was amazed about how the place changed over the day. How do you see? How do you see? I was thinking about my eye. Um, we see black and white with the recept. We have two receptor in our eye: the rod and the cone. The rod work with black and white, they're faster, they give you an orientation, and somehow they allow you to see the space very quickly. Color comes later. Color is seen at second moment, even if they're a fraction of second. And I was thinking about how the, what, what was a color, and I think color is not an extra information. It's not about being closer to the reality, because color wasn't there at night. Color was there with the skies, colors were there with the light. Color is just a, another phenomenon, very ephemeral. They can disappear. And it can bring just an extra layer of event that happen over the day or the night when you are somewhere. So color, it, it's not a way to be closer to the reality because it can disappear. I think it's almost the opposite. Color brings you away. Next. 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 I, I just wanted to talk one second here about the art of framing. This, this building, like I mentioned, is made of water, stone, light. So all the tectonic um, element, like the wall, the floor, the ceiling, are this what make the space existing. They are very strong, vertical, horizontal element. But the moment I frame, the moment I release my shutter, they become bidimensional element that depict the materiality. And this transition is what an amazing moment. This line of light, it's a six meter wide window. So it's only a little line because of my camera, because of my eyes, because of the framing, because of the point of view. So as, as a photographer, we can change completely the space. So there's no way we're going to be instead of the building with an image. We create a, a completely new, new world. It has to be seen with a lot of respect and a lot of um, knowledge of what is the architecture. Um, and that's where often I compare my work with the, a musician with a score. You have a score, you have to know what you're playing, but you're still playing, and the score is the architecture. Next, please. This is just, just a moment where I was trying to describe how do you see, how do you see there, you see the landscape, but the moment you see, you don't see the surroundings. So I took my camera and stay at the same height that the, your head will be at the chair and moved back somehow that you create that, that, that tension between the camera you know is there, a point of view which is the person sitting and the outside. Next, please. 
And this is uh, one of the, um, the last image of Valls, again, to talk about this presence of color, a color which is, again, temporary. The grass is not green. I will never photograph green grass. It was after the winter when everything was dry. And the building, it's, it's somehow framing this amazing mountain. It's, it's um, on top of you when you're swimming, when you're there. When you are. The building has this fantastic position of being to protect you, to hold the water, but to also bring you out to understand the world. Next. Few images of John Hedrick here, different from the one of the exhibition. Like I said, he had a great influence in um, uh, the way I started to photograph architecture. Even if I never been his student, I think I had a lot of influence. And he always said he was uh, teaching by osmosis. And I really believe because uh, it just gave me, he thought, just by being there. Next, please. Maybe it's nice to see any images. Um, somehow, there's many phases in the process of making architecture, like you all know uh, much better than me. And you have this moment where the thought are still dreams, concept that the architect is playing with. And then you have the construction, the drawing, the bit dimension, then the models. And at one point, you build, hopefully, the building. And at the end, they have photographs. And is that there is this very strong need to go back to the bidimensionality. Um, in my work, if I can go back to that moment of dream, I really fulfill what I would like to do. And um, it's somehow to forget about everything and to go to the main concept that made the building to be there. And uh, I must say, I had this wonderful moment when Judge. Eric was phoning me from New York and said, Ellen, you photograph all the things I wanted to do and didn't manage. So it was really fantastic. This is the House of the Suicide and the House of the Mother of the Suicide. You have uh, other photographs in the exhibition, but that was the one that we built in Prague. Um, if you're not familiar with the work, it's quite emotional work, and it was very emotional to have it here because they are based on the poem of Jan Pollock. Um, Jan, uh, David Shapiro, they was talking about the student Jan Pollock in 68 that killed himself by uh, um, burning himself in a square uh, to stay free from the Soviet army coming. And um, he, I think he stayed a very heroic, heroic figure in uh, Czech uh, society. And there's this beautiful poem. And in, in the work of Hedrick, the the object and the subject I, I embody in the same, and there's the house of the mother with the pain and the house of a fire, it, it, it's the sun, and they're facing each other. Next, please. And in the end, there's only a light inside the body of the little house of the mother, the one which has the spike, which are more narrow, the other one, not the fire, the other sun. It's somehow this idea of fire or pain coming into the body of the mother. Next, please. And we had, he, over the year, there was this amazing collection of, um, of character, of building, of structure, which were built by students. And uh, we had the collapse of time on wheels. So I'd like to show again the security, which was um, also on wheel. And this idea of having nomadic architecture for me was fantastic, the idea that they could move, they could go somewhere else. Next, please. Next. So over the year, I built uh, like a family of wheels that um, are all part of this different project. Um, it was quite amazing. Once um, I had a lecture with Jita Turner. She is a photographer from America that also photographed Hedrick and Eisenman. And she had a great influence in, on my work. And I think I started to photograph architecture because I was inspired by her. And about 10 years ago, I met, and she had a lecture. And, and she had a photograph of wheels. And I said, oh, this is really therapeutic. We need to see possibility of movement. We really have this desire also of, uh, of something that moves, but not really like a wheel on, on a project like this. Next, please. This is the collapse of time, building back for square. Next. 
And to finish the work about um, HEDUC, we have the um, little project in Cronningham. It was an installation uh, that the city asked um, HEDUC and many other artists to sign the edge of the city where there's only uh, medieval archaeological remain that nobody can see, but they could by creating this moment of uh, attraction with the building or with uh, just a tree, um, uh, give an idea of what the city was and had it with the Tower of Cart. Next, please. Next, please. Next. In the exhibition, and here I also brought the Church of Leverance. Um, it was one of the first buildings I photographed. Um, I was asked to make a book for the Architectural Association. Alvin Boyaski sent me there when I was a very young photographer and I had more my not much of an experience and I still consider some of my best photo, photo, uh, photo even now. I just want to stop and talk a little bit about um, about this image where, cry, where I try to create. Um, reality is very rich and over history uh, of painting there's always been this this difficulty of how to reproduce reality and sometimes the richness bring to the artist in early time to create icons, symbol, um, metaphor, other technique to recall something. And we have such a realistic medium that um, our task is with, with something so realistic, how can you call, how can you remember, how can you create an imaginary moment to open up and have another level of expression. Next, please. So I mentioned this, uh, this possibility of displace the photograph and um, to bring it to assemblage, to bring it together. And there's an art in that which is very important. Um, those two photographs are brought together because they have a geometry which is similar in the center. One is a shadow, one is a tree. And the fact that maybe you don't realize immediately, but your eyes will definitely recall that and uh, your imagination will start to say why, is that something there or not? And then you go to next images. And I think those, mem those moments are very special moments. They really allowed you to, to, to come out from the image and to think again uh, in, a, in, in a wider dimension. Next. So in that case, the work was mostly concentrated on the skin of the building, of course, the way it related to the tree, the outside, which are almost echoing the, 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 or the, 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 the building is bringing back the tree or the tree are bringing to the, to the work of the masonry, which was absolutely amazing. Uh, but also inside how the light, it's, creating a new layer of light in the front of the world. Next. Next. So we're going to leave a bit of architecture for a while um, and talk about this new project of landscape uh, I've done last three, four years. I was asked by an association in Switzerland to photograph the landscape for a big exhibition which called Paysage en Poetry. We were three photographers and three poets and we were given a, a year of work, so quite consistency, to explore a very specific area. I always had the suspicion, they thought I'm going to photograph nice little uh, wooden houses and roof and uh, because they're very beautiful. I can't say that they're not. And in that area, they're very beautiful. But of course, I wanted to have a challenge, and that would have been too easy. So I, I really wanted to see if all this thought uh, that I had uh, photographing um, architecture could be also applied to a bigger dimension. And, um, and it was fantastic. Even very scary, somehow, that you don't have that body of work or the architecture or the 
behind you, you discover that, uh, yes, there's other forces that create space, which are also quite powerful. There are very specific moments. In, in this one, next please, I just uh, look at one shadow going down a valley over an afternoon. So just, just moving down, next please, until it rested on the ground and the night came. Next. Then I tried to question how do you see and how do you recognize things. And I wanted to photograph also objects that somehow have reference to, to the landscapes, almost to start to think that what we see is all also um, made by us and the way we perceive and have this doubt in between uh, the two reality. Next. So the fold of a uh, old plastic protecting wood and the fold of the landscape are, are somehow brought together. Next. And then, of course, the geometry is very important if you are an architecture photographer. So I started to be fascinated by the diagonal. And uh, it was pre-Alp, so um, it was not climbing high mountain. It's still very soft. But all the time, you're confronted with this very gentle slope. An event are just coming over the day on the slope. Next, please. Oh, there's more upstairs than you can see that. To finish, um, I will uh, like to talk about this project, which is also not finished. It's about glaciers in some island in Sweden. The wife of Peter Zunter asked me to photograph landscape for the hotel around, so to move away from the bath and photograph nature. And I, um, I went quite high to photograph the, the, the ice. Next, please. And I started to look at the crack that are created over time uh, when the ice start to melt. Um, you barely see it because i not yet very high, but they, they create this opening up um, very, very slowly. And the water is running low when you see it very deep. Next, please. But that same summer, I was also in Sweden in an island. Sweden was covered by the ice cap very long time ago, and uh, the ice was probably cracking in the same way that the glaciers and letting um, in those cracks different sediment to fell down, to, to, to enter the stones next. So I was completely fascinated to see the same kind of, um, of, um, of mark in the stones of the, the, um, the island in Sweden and the one in Switzerland. Over the, it's the same machinery, it's the same tool they created uh, condition over many, many years. Next, please. So this is in Sweden, the crack. The next, please. And this is in in uh, glaciers next to valleys. So it's the beauty of um, the modeling of form that nature can make. And I would like to finish the lecture with this slide. First question, I am not thinking about the work with a fixed scale um, most of the time. Let's say the landscape, let's put it on side because it's slightly different. 
Uh, some artists really think about their work and they're going to be one meter by one meter and that's it. I do have an idea of sizes more or less, but because again it's space, when there's an exhibition, I like to react to, this, to, to the room. And if I come with a series of image which will not work out there, then it's, uh, it's a pity or I will decide to change room. Um, that's a playful thing to do. But if I think about the image of La Tourette that, that are here, they are these sizes and they are never going to be in any other size. So they are pretty much like I want to see because there's a, there's a question of details that I like to be slightly bigger than what they are in reality to create <laughs> the moment of doubt. In the landscape, there was a lot of thinking before to do the image, like also to decide to have a square format and uh, to don't have any uh, rise horizon, to don't have any sky, any big mountains, and to, to work often with details um, which are going to give you this feeling of endlessness because they are bigger than what you see, because there is a moment of doubt of what they are. Are they really of just a fold of you know, ice or are they a big mountains? And in that case, the sizes is very important. So each project is slightly different, but again, I really like to play with the room and say, you know, we, we can create something new by playing with the size. So yeah. So. But now when I look at Hedwig in the room, I think it should be always be like that and never <laughs> other size because I love it very much. So it's... Uh, Then you, you mentioned that when you started making an excursion into landscape photography, you, you came very much as an architectural photographer and you're looking for structures which like diagonals or stuff. I'm just wondering after after this escapade, are you coming back to architectural photography with a different way of seeing things? Is, has your new experience opened up a different way of looking at architecture? Hmm. I think it's difficult because each project that I'm photographing is so different. Again, I, I cannot apply the way I work. There's some continuity, but I think that I cannot apply the same way if I'm photographing Zunto or Zahade. So, um, um, I don't know. But perhaps it, it allows me to be more free. Per per perhaps it's a process that, that, that because there I was completely free. When I'm back to architecture, I feel also the courage to, to let it go more, which is somehow very good. Because there's, there's always in the work a tension between, uh, you know, uh, is there the architecture? How, mu how much can you play with it? And um, the desire to to, to, to be more and more playful, maybe can be more fulfilled after such an experience. So, uh, but I have to think about it. Anyway. <laughs> I think one of the things that comes out in the uh, in the interview that's in this month's magazine is is the role of collaboration somehow when you're working with images. It comes out in your in your conversation with Zaha about 20 years of work. I'm I'm wondering if you might say something about that running through your entire body of work? Is it something that you strike your own terms with each architect differently, or is it a kind of given that you start the operations with conversations and discussions, or? I think it's different with yeah. every architect. Also, every architect has a different relation with photography. In some case, there's a lot of involvement, but they say, I'm happy if there are many photographers coming and many different story, and I, I'm not worried about that. In some cases, there's enormous control, like Zunter, doesn't want to publish, it doesn't want any magazine too much, it wants few image, so the collaboration is, uh, is more intense, even if sometimes it's not so direct. Because when I did the book, we talked about, but then he said, please, it's my birthday today, I don't want to see any building of my building, don't ask me to show you a building, and you know, he plays some music. And uh, in the end, um, I could understand his sensibility, not walking into the space, so those things happen in a, uh, and with Zaha, it's also very, it's very magic how things come. She would phone or sell little things, and then she said, you know, 
that I know where is the concern, but we're not going to be over and over again on how to do it. And I think that comes also with a lot of, um, of maturity in relation to the work. The more the, more, the, more the work is, is young, the more there's tension about how it's going to be photographed. Mm -hmm. But I, I really um, like a lot to follow the career of somebody. So I, all the time I'm happy to work with young people because that's, that's how you see things coming up and, uh, and, and developing in the years. So. Other questions? I think we'll stop there. Thank you very much for oh, coming back. Pleasure.